So we're here at Kokomo Toys and Collectibles, and uh, can you give me your name and what it is that you do? Uh, in the G.I. Joe community, I'm uh, known as Gyre Viper. Um, wow, I grew up in uh, Wrigleyville in Chicago, uh, three blocks from Wrigley Field. I spent 98% of my life. Um, spent a lot of time in the, uh, the, the local Chicago drum and bass scene. Um, worked at Tower Records for three years, uh, which was um, actually something I really enjoyed. It wasn't, for me, it wasn't just a job. It was a, it was a way to take my love for music and uh, spend all day talking about it. I love movies. I love complaining about movies. Um, <laughs> Don't we all? Yes. Yeah. No, I like every chance I get. Uh, I love to criticize movies, even movies I like, um, because I care that much about them, even bad movies. Right. Um, other than that, it's uh, that's sort of my the the extent of my uh, of what I take seriously. Okay. So, do you you still live in Chicago? Yes. Okay, so we're in Kokomo, Indiana, which is a little ways away. What 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 drives you to come down to Kokomo? Um, right? about four or five years ago, um, they held the first Coil Con, which is a GI Joe convention uh, run by the uh, the Coil Club, and uh, just CoilCon.com. And um, uh, I was told you need to come to this. And at the time, I was new to the GI Joe hobby as far as collecting goes. And um, I was like, okay. Normally, that's not the type of thing I would have done. A, because I was uh, new to collecting, um, as far as being an adult collector. And two, I just kind of a recluse and like to get out of the house. Didn't yeah. never really felt like going anywhere. And uh, my friend Josh said, no, you need to come do this. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and it was on uh, on Todd's lawn uh, where this toy, this toy, this this store used to be located. Um, and so it would be Todd's old store and then he would have the entire lawn just full of like dealers and Joe people and that was the first coil con and it was like a couple dozen people and that was it hmm. but um it was a great time it was really intimate it was really you got to no one was uh, a stranger you know um honestly as long as you engage and uh and don't pull away you you can just make friends in this hobby like like everyone in this in this hobby is so welcoming and that's what coil con was this embodiment of that it was this you could just insert yourself in it, and you were part of it. And um, pretty much everyone that was at that first event, for the most part, ended up becoming more involved with the coil cons in general. So that year after year, they became sort of the. Uh, it was just uh, very fulfilling, and I told myself I would never miss it. And so, um, even though it's a three and a half hour drive, if I ever get the chance to come out and hang out with Todd or any of these guys in Indiana, it's totally worth my time because. Um, every single one of them is, is, is just a super great person or, you know, yeah. intelligent. And yeah, I've, I've had really good experience with people here so far. I, I love this store. The store is just huge and massive. It's got everything, you know, He-Man, Transformers, all the stuff that I used to grow up with. And, uh, like that stuff really resonates with, with me. And, um, and we know, I've noticed you've brought a lot of stuff here today. What, what exactly is it that you collect? Like, what is this, what are these things? Um, I pretty much exclusively collect G.I. Joe pre-production. Prototypes, mock-ups, um, canceled figures, unreleased figures, artwork. I mean, not not in, a, in excess. I'm very picky about what I collect. Right. Uh, everything, I, everything I have that I keep in my collection, uh, no matter what I find, I want it to be able to tell a story. Or what I like is when people look at something in my collection and they have to be reminded they're looking at G.I. Joe. Like, I love the weird stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I pretty much just stick to prototypes and that sort of thing okay. um, and the history of it it's actually it's more so than this stuff this stuff is nice to own and it's fun to own and it's great and but for me it's the information I collect GI Joe information more than anything else um, which is why when I find 10 things and I might only keep one the fact that I could find those 10 things even if it's a like a memo or a piece of paper is just the greatest thing for me that's like cool. just the, the stories and the knowledge so I collect that more than anything honestly oh, that's good so what do your family and friends think of your collecting stuff? Well, uh, my friends, who obviously are not G.I. Joe collectors, um, they were confused because for a long time, uh, you know, uh, writing in college or music is what they knew my, my passions were. They expected me to start a record label or write a book of poetry, something. And uh, they saw me uh, sort of just completely... Uh, immersed in that and so when I started doing this it was really kind of jarring for them they understood that it was uh, 
that there was something in my personality that was, uh, you know, harking back to my childhood, and that that part they got. But dedicating every ounce of my of my free time to that uh, really confused them. But they've they've accepted it. They joked about it for a while. But no, they've accepted it. And as far as my family, you know, it's just eh, it's some. Everyone has something they do, whether it's you know physical, mental, you know. And uh, as far as this, I guess no one really cares. Really, I don't know anyone would. I mean, I guess it's easy if you're another toy collector, but I don't. I don't walk into someone's house. Well, I guess because I do this, mm -hmm. I walk into someone's house and I see their tools and I see their number. Oh, that's interesting. Where most people just be like, I don't why it doesn't. Right. Not everyone cares about stuff, so I try not to think. I try not to overthink that that aspect. Okay. To assume that my family should think anything of it at all. Okay. I don't know. Well, so would you consider like a, a niche field, a niche market? Um, yeah, it's it's as far as prototype collecting, it's it's pretty niche. I mean, there's there's people who dabble in it like loosely, who just oh here and there, and then there's people that are. I mean, they just, uh, they're, like, they're like machines, like animals. They just consume it. Um, but a lot of it's very isolated. A lot of it's very private. Um, you know, uh, a lot of it's very, quote, unquote, privileged. Like, you know, you're lucky if you get to see stuff at all. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it should be a, a good word for it. Okay. Um, I'd say it's more like a, like a shadow niche. It's like even, you know, more off to the side. So... So what do you do when you're not focused on collecting? Um, uh, I've spent the last two years trying to decide what I consider the ten best films of all time, <laughs> which has taken far longer than I thought, but it's actually kind of important to me. I, I love film, and um, I love arguing about Like I said, I love arguing about film, so like, or at least just criticizing it, and so that actually is a lot of fun to me, but it's kind of draining after a while because then you start overthinking it and you're wondering if you actually really enjoy something or if you're trying to um that takes up a lot of my time um other than that it's just been gi joe hmm. and gi joe history just because i'm i'm always touring my collection or helping someone else tour their collection or you know doing podcasts or articles or i'm just i mean it just it's it's sort of become not my life but it's become a large part of it so everything else has kind of gone you know what would you say is the most significant piece in your collection? Um, so basically, in uh, in 1980, um, and even a little bit before that, um, Hasbro designers really wanted to. A few of them really wanted to bring GI Joe back because it had ended after you know Super Joe, the 12 inch line, all that stuff. And Hasbro just wasn't interested. Um, it, it just wasn't something that they thought uh, was viable. I mean, you got you're coming off of Vietnam. You're going into the 80s, mm -hmm. which is a whole other thing in its own, and Hasbro just had no interest in G.I. Joe, um, even though that was sort of the brand that, along with things like Mr. Potato Head and Pencil Boxes, had gotten Hasbro where it was. Um, but it had kind of fallen off. It was a new generation. It was just, but, but these people really wanted um, G.I. Joe to be resurrected. And um, at the same time, they were trying to get other sort of military lines, um, you know, kind of out there. There was this uh, line called Rough Trucks, which were these shift control things where um, uh, you know, you'd shift forward and the tank would go forward or the truck, whatever. Um, and uh, there's a few pieces of art um, that are out there. I own one of them and they're dated 1980. They don't say G.I. Joe anywhere on them, but they're part of this, this rough trucks thing. And um, uh, the first one uh, is obviously what turned into the G.I. Joe vamp, which is the Jeep. The next one is the air Jeep, which was this weird mash looking helicopter thing, which obviously became the Skyhawk. There was a shift control tank, which became the Mobat. There was a missile launcher that didn't really turn into anything. But anyways, um, even though this art doesn't say G.I. Joe on it, and it's dated 1980, which is before G.I. Joe sort of existed again in the foreign scale, these are the, uh, the, the, the precursors uh, to G.I. Joe because uh, one of the rough trucks that there was actually a prototype for, um, Ron Rudette, who was a, one of the most well-known G.I. Joe designers, painted it up and threw a G.I. Joe logo on it in a meeting with a bunch of other stuff without saying a word about it, really. And mm -hmm. that, that logo on that truck, is, they, it's called the seed of G.I. Joe. It's what, what, they, what everyone sort of agrees um, hit management subconscious and kind of brought it, uh, just sort of gave it that much light that it didn't have before. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so anyways, so they had this rough trucks idea. And... Um, 
and Ron did that with the logo, whatever. And at some point, they finally got management. Uh, Hassenfeld, actually, uh, the guy who was in charge then of Hasbro, um, said, you know, okay, fine. You have one month to convince me that G.I. Joe is even remotely viable. And so everyone scrambled. Uh, R&D, uh, the designers, the marketers, they all did their own, they all came up with their own uh, sort of pitch to bring to this, you know, this seminal meeting. And um, so one of the sculptors, his name was Jim Totley, um, he's this famous uh, African-American sculptor. Um, he actually has sculptures, um, I think, in Boston at the Orange Line, and he has sculptures outside other, uh, you know, like commercial establishments. Um, and, um, but he was not only like a commercial sculptor, he was also, he, he loved uh, toys. He was also, a, a, like toy designing was like one of his passions. It wasn't just a job for him. Some people, they get a job and, you know, they're making toys because they're good at, you know, they have an engineering background and that's just the job they got. For them, it's just a job. For him, it was both. It was, it was art fused with uh, science and technology and sculpting mm -hmm. and, you know, toy making. So anyways, um, Jim Totley, uh, as the meetings, I think it was like two weeks out or so, um, ran out to the store um, and uh, bought a competitor figure. And it was a Buck Rogers Tiger Man figure, which is what is under here. Okay. And he brought this back to his desk and he sculpted onto it and he painted it and he gave it military details. Gone, there's a canteen on the back. He's got pockets. He's got, you know, these straps here. Um, give it a helmet. And if you actually, it's, it's weird over time, but if you look, there's actually camouflage paint. So it's actually a camo deco. It's not just as plain green as it looks. Okay. Um, it would probably look closer to Stalker here. Okay. Um, and uh, so he brought this Tiger Man figure back to his ass, threw some clay on it as fast as he could, painted it up. And uh, he brought this into the meeting. And uh, he, it was basically to show Hasbro management that G.I. Joe, because at the time they, they had... They thought, hey, we could do G.I. Joe at this three and three quarter scale like Star Wars, like Mego, and people management like, no, no one cares. No one's gonna want we don't want that, no, it's not gonna happen. We can't do it articulated. If Rough Trucks had gone through, and even if it had become G.I. Joe, figures were supposed to be the accessories. Mm. And some of the stories we've heard is that they would have just been torsos glued into the vehicles. Oh wow. Um, and not full figures. And at the very least they weren't gonna be articulated and have detail. Huh. Like that was never even on the table until Jim Totley brought this into a meeting and said, no, look, we can do the articulation of Mego. We can do the detail of Star Wars. We can do, you know, we can do faces. We can do, you know, clothing. We could do weapons. And um, I actually have the certificate from Greg Bernston, who was a J.J. designer there at the time. Um, and um, it, uh, you know, he bit, the end of this says, it was also instrumental for the development of the figure's articulation and movement for the proposed new line. Um, sort of premise of this was was Hasbro and Hasbro other companies do this all the time but Hasbro would do it a lot they would always rely on a competitor figure to push the envelope so even though it wasn't always Hasbro's idea mm -hmm. they were really good at going out and getting something and at least coming up with an idea using a competitor's toy so it kind of goes like this so a Buck Rogers figure is responsible for I mean, not the figure itself. I mean, obviously, just the idea behind it. But so, Buck Rogers Tiger Man. Without Buck Rogers Tiger Man, if you really wanted to overgeneralize and just make it mm -hmm. pretty, uh, without Buck Rogers Tiger Man, GI Joe would not conceivably um, be this articulated, detailed line, wow. which could could mean in a parallel universe like sliders or something that GI Joe does not become successful <laughs> in 1982, um, and therefore Hasbro cannot get the rights to Transformers. Wow. And therefore, that and, and another aspect of J.I. Joe's history is that in order to promote the toys, because of the FCC laws at the time, you were all, like He-Man did it, there's a very limited window you could have between cartoons, comics, commercials, and toys, and how that all ties together to promote hmm. it. Hasbro found a loophole with their comic book where they could do commercials for the comics, which were commercials for the toys, essentially. Right. And that loophole actually influenced not just toy companies, but all companies to an extent were able to then find their own loopholes to promote stuff that the FCC was like, you can't do it this way. Like, G.I. Joe changed that landscape. Um, and it wasn't the first time. The 12-inch G.I. Joe was the first marketed action figure. That's and that showed other companies, oh, we can, really? We can do this? We were just hoping people might buy it. So that's the second time in history G.I. Joe has changed not just toys, but the way the world kind of, and obviously I'm yeah. really right. broadly over -gener Like, But I mean, if you want to get poetic about it, so without... So without Buck Rogers, Tiger Man, 
G.I. Joe, conceivably, again, an alternate universe, doesn't get successful. Transformers doesn't get purchased the way it was through Hasbro, um, which doesn't make it the huge success it is. I mean, you can see the domino effect. Now, obviously, yeah. you can do that with almost anything in the world. That's but true. we're sitting here and we're talking about this, so that's... Yeah. As far as being my most significant piece, yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of... it. You know, without the 1980 artwork, this wouldn't have gotten that far, and you can obviously trace it back. But as far as action figures go, and the way that we understand action figures today, it kind of starts with this. Even though Star Wars predates it, even though Mego obviously predates it, right. um, that's what it took. It took someone saying, you know what, I'm just going to take the competitor product, I'm going to make it look like I think G.I. Joe's can look. And I mean, if you look at this, if you look at the straps, on, these aren't prototypes, obviously, I got these from Todd's store, these are just not G.I. but... Oops. If you look at the straps, if you look at like the detail on with the grenade, I mean it's very similar. Like the translation was, you know, was right. pretty on point. Obviously they there's some detail that didn't make it for cost. You know, there's not a lot of pockets on the legs, but right. the idea is there. Um, you know, the the aesthetics are there. Um, you know, and these were um, the, the heads on these actually were sculpted by Jim Totley, who did that. He did most of the okay. 82 heads. Okay. So the translation was, you know, he was in control of of the, the, the head sculpts and, and sort of the look of Jejo to an extent from this moment on um, until he passed away in 1986. Oh. So as to answer your question, this would be my most uh, significant piece because I mean, it we wouldn't be sitting here um, and as I kind of joked to Todd earlier that you know his store might not be here because of all the, all the action figure lines that not, they don't exist because of G.I. Joe, but G.I. Joe was the competition. Right. And so, you know, and like Transformers, you know, Hasbro was able to purchase Transformers because of, or at least, you know, get that connection with Takara because of the success of G.I. Joe. Like 1982, 1983, they were like, hey, we're rolling in it. Like, I mean, the 80s for Hasbro was so profitable that they were just throwing money around. Wow. Um, you know, sculptors would get paid between like 1000 and $8,000 a sculpt. Wow. Um, you know, they're painters. I mean, they would hire these these professional painters and sculptors who were, you know, uh, well-known in their own fields. They didn't have to go make toys, but Hasbro said, we want the best of the best. Where Toy Biz would hire these amazing people and tell them, tone it down, we don't want the best of the best. Hasbro, they just kept, it was just, for them, it was just, we have all this money, we're not going to spare any expense. But I mean, um, that, 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 this is the sounds like you actually have like the the one that started it all. Yeah. The, the one G.I. Yeah. Joe. But how did you how did you get a hold of it? So um, Greg Bernstein, um, who was a, uh, a Hasbro designer and one of the original, uh, they call it's funny because there's there's 13 original G.I. Joes, and just indirectly um, they kind of referred to themselves a few of them as the original 13. It was uh, 13 designers who all just kind of. Um, you know, they were in it together in the beginning. So Greg Burns, who was one of the original 13, he had, re he had preserved a whole lot of prototypes and, like, uh, um, some vehicles and some, some figures and some, uh, some two-ups like this. And um, he had put a bunch of stuff on eBay. And the thing is, a few... Before I got into this hobby, it was, like, 2006 or seven. at... I think it was, like, at a Kansas convention. Or maybe it was... Maybe it wasn't Kansas. I wasn't around, so I didn't pay much attention, but... Um, which is irresponsible of me. <laughs> but he had brought everything that he owned, still, to this convention to show everybody okay. on a table. And this is one of the things he had. So when I heard that he had this, I reached out to him, and I was like... I was like, first of all, like, you know, I've seen all your stuff on eBay. Like, it's great stuff, but it's not stuff I'm really interested in. This is something I would be really interested in. I was like, well, I haven't really dug it out yet, and if I sell it, it'd probably be the last thing I'd ever sell. Wow. Because of what it is. And we, we talked, and I interviewed him. I got all these, you know, we had this back and forth. Instead of just saying, I swear, I, a lot of people, they approach these designers and go, I love G.I. Joe, and I, I think it's great, and I, it means so much to me. And they try to get something, and then they just turn around and flip it to someone like me. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they, but that's the nature of things. So that's, that's like, yeah, that's yeah, just yeah, how it is. True. It's not, it's what it is. Yeah. So, but I just said, I had all these references. I was like, look, just ask this person, this person, this person, and if you feel comfortable still talking to me, you know, I don't, I never presume that I'm entitled to that information. Right. Um, you know, I try to let people know that I'm doing this because I love it and whatever. And um, he sold everything that I could, that, that most people could remember he brought to that convention, and, you know, that was it. And uh, I sent him a message, and I was like, um, you know, did you ever find that Megos figure? And he's like, he's like, actually, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, um, do you want it? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, all right, I'll sell it to you. Now, he could have put this on eBay, and yeah. everyone could have fought yeah. for it. I'm sure there would have been a fight, too. Knowing what it is. Now, <laughs> because it's not technically a G.I. Joe, and because it has no G.I. Joe parts. There are pre-production collectors who think it's only worth a certain amount. Okay. Okay. 
the other half are people who think that it's wholly significant and is responsible for anyone collecting any JJ prototypes to an extent. So therefore, it's it's worth a lot. Okay. But honestly, it's only worth what someone's willing to pay, or you know what someone's willing to want. So it's like. But anyways, part of that was like, you know, I was, he could have put that on eBay and had both sides kind of fight. The people that would have only bid it up to what they think it's worth because it has no G.I. Joe parts and it's not, I mean, technically it's not a G.I. Joe prototype. It's the G.I. Joe prototype, but it's not a G.I. Joe prototype. And then the people who would have bid, for, I mean, he could have done that and he didn't. He, for whatever reason, he decided that, that I, you know, that, that I was, it was okay that I had it, even though I didn't really know him. I'd only talked to him a few times via email. Um, I was a newer collector. I didn't bid on any of the, most people like I didn't bid on any of his stuff on eBay because I was holding out for that. Mm. And most people be like, "Oh, well, you didn't spend any money. I'm not gonna, you know." So for whatever reason, Greg, um, to go ahead, and he was nice enough to include a certificate that explains what it is and give me more information about it. And um, uh, that's how I ended up with it. And I love it. It's it's, you know, it's one of those things where. Um, where I always try to bring it wherever I go, like whenever I set up my collection or mm -hmm. you know, a few of us set up our collection, I always bring it even though a lot of people might have seen it um, or know what it is, I feel like it sort of has to be there because of what it is. Like even if people had seen it a hundred times, I'd probably still have to to bring it just because no. of, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's it's weighty, understand. for what it is, there's a lot of weight to it. Did you want me to move on to other stuff? Uh, well, I yeah. can talk about this forever. You, well, you were talking, uh, you said this is a two-up. Can you okay, explain yeah. what so, this is? So, um, and it's not done so much now. And sometimes now, when it's done, it's done kind of as a an homage to the way things used to be done. So, uh, in the 80s, um, some companies, depending on how they did things, would sculpt things at two to, two to one scale or two up. So, this is the... Uh, this is a two-up original sculpt, hand sculpted. This isn't a copy or anything. Wow. Um, of Cobra Ferret. Okay, so um, a sculptor would sculpt these at two to one. They would get sculpt sheets uh, that of of a four view of the figure with like this, the back, I've, the sides. I've seen, yeah. I've seen that before. And yeah. so from that, and then from reference material like this, a sculptor would uh, would sit down and begin a sculpt. This was sculpted by uh, Bill Merkline, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, he sculpted for Toy Biz, Knickerbocker. Um, he sculpted the Krull figures for the Krull movie that never came out. Okay. Um, he sculpted a lot of X-Men figures. Um, he sculpted the Alien 3 kit. There's like a model kit, whatever. Okay. Um, he sculpted the Dove that's on your Visa card. And he, sculpt he still has really? it. He sculpted it one-to-one. -one. Wow. He was, he, was, he was the only person that could sculpt holograms to that extent. So Visa wow. and American Banknote... Um, he sculpted the hologram that's on the first holographic issue of National Geographic. Okay. Um, anyway, so he's this massively talented sculptor. So the original sculpts for some of these actually were hand-painted, the clay. We've seen the older two-ups where they took the original sculpt and painted over it. And the problem with that is is that at the time, because it was new, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the paint's peeling off because the clay these, these shrink, depending okay. on what they're made out of. Um, you know, waxes shrink, clay shrinks, or they would right. break them up to reuse what's underneath. Okay. Um, underneath is what's known as a standard buck, which you can't, you can kind of see, I can't really show the people on the, the camera. I should have actually brought a buck because I'm, I'm a moron. But a standard buck um, is a, a two-up armature, um, usually Dynacast, urethane, something, and that's what they would sculpt upon. Okay. And uh, so they would sculpt onto this buck and uh, then make a copy and then one copy be painted, which would be for color reference, like this. Okay. So that China or even Hasbro knew what what the colors would be. Um, okay. And then another copy would be used for tooling. Uh, so what they would do is they would send it over to China or even in-house at Hasbro, and they would panograph it. So the machine would do this, and then it would copy a smaller one like that to make a, the, the actual size. And that's what they would use to make the molds, uh, to make the test shots, to then make the figures. So... But they would do this for, for a few reasons. They would they would sculpt two ups, um, one because it was sort of the way things were done. Even though like it Star Wars was sort of one to one, but they right. were they weren't articulated. Okay. They didn't have action features. That's true. And, you know. That's true. So and their detail was a little different than mm -hmm. than this. Um, again, it's Hasbro taking what one company was doing and doing it differently and better to an right. extent. Uh, they would do this not only just for detail because I mean if you look at this obviously these details have to get shrunken down but still be re recognizable, whether right. it's facial features, whether it's, uh, you know, yeah. these straps, whatever. Um, another was, was you know, quality control. Um, these things had to be perfect. Like, these things had to be engineered so perfectly 
that you know uh, you didn't choke on him as a kid. Right. Like that was sort of the the thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, Bill would get paid just stupid money for that. He did about seventy GI Joes, and I think he got paid between like fifteen hundred and eight thousand, depending on what it was and depending on the work. And he was always paid for his time as a freelancer. Wow. Um, just like I said, Hasbro was just throwing money around. So, anyways, um, these are two ups. Um, you know, uh, Toy Biz did two ups. Um, Bill actually sculpted some of those. Um, and Toy Biz two ups. Obviously, if a two if, if a Toy Biz figure is this big, the two ups about this big. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a few of them. They're just they're massive. They're like giant, <laughs> crazy statues of your favorite toys. Wow. That's um, cool. And so this is called a a pattern or an original sculpt because I mean this is uh, Bill would sculpt an epoxy. It was like a two part epoxy plumber seal combination. He would he would switch it up, and it was so sturdy and so perfect that Hasbro didn't really need to to. To, to do much with these, it would just that's why most of his exist. Where theirs were done in clay or wax, and they would break them down oh, okay. or destroy them and reuse the buck. So a lot of the original sculpts are gone unless they were done by someone like Bill who sculpted in something that wasn't so fragile. Okay. Um, so this is a two-up paint master, and this is what they would use uh, for presentation. They would send one of these, which was more artic like some of these are articulated. This mm -hmm. one's not because it's just for presentation and for color. Okay. Um, the articulated ones they would send over to China, either painted or unpainted for reference or so they could do the tooling and the panographing. Hmm. Um, so this is Desert Scorpion. Um, here's a production one. You can see that they're, you know. Two one. Yeah. They are. Um, and now some independent companies like Four Horsemen um, who do stuff for like Mattel oh, yeah. and Power Lords, they'll yeah. do two-ups, but I don't know how much of that is cosmetic. I know that sometimes you can get their two-ups and their Kickstarter is like mm -hmm. a thing. But I don't know if they use those for tooling. I've never okay. really investigated that. But it, it's I love that people still work in that form because yeah. there are people who I mean for a long time Bill Merkline was telling Hasbro, you know you can do these at scale. I can sculpt these one to one for you and it'll be cheaper. And Hasbro's like, eh. We found out that some stuff was sculpted one to one, mm -hmm. but we can't pin down what. We've heard okay. stories of it, and I have a feeling that if we know what is what was sculpted one to one, there's probably a difference in the quality or what breaks or maybe it turned out really well and they just still thought it was I mean yeah. if you're a company the cha switching things up really fast on people can you might all of a sudden have sculptors who only can only really do this and then you have low quality figures like it I don't know I wasn't there right. um, in 1983 though um, they came up with a sculpting Bible and uh, in pre-production terms a Bible is any kind of guide that um, like there's like style guides there's um, you know what a character can be like, what a character can do, what his personality has to be every time he's portrayed. Okay. But they also had it for stuff like sculpting and art. So in the sculpting guide, which was done in 1983, they sort of lay out how they want things to be for now, and it describes every piece on this standard buck that's underneath there and, and how it should be done. So it wasn't, I mean, like, this thing reads like stereo instructions. It's just <laughs> so awesome. much for for something that is so disposable. Yeah. That's, you know what I mean? That's, that's true. I mean, we're yeah. not even supposed to be sitting here talking about this. I mean, this was not designed for us to be sitting and having a conversation about 30 years later. This this, this is only necessary so that you don't choke on it. Like, that's all this is. Wow. So it's just, you know. That, I mean, a lot of that's care all. and detail gone, has gone into this stuff. And, yeah. Um, it, it is pretty amazing to the to the extent someone will go to to make sure it looks Yeah. Looks good. Looks well, perfect. Looks on, right. on that same note, there's there's stuff like like this. Uh, what what is that? That doesn't okay, even look so like this GI is, Joe. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Like I said earlier, I like the stuff where people look at my collection and they have to be reminded they're not looking at Thundercats or He Man. <laughs> yeah. um, this is Star Brigade War Dog, okay. and um, he this is the two up for it. So he would have actually ended up being about this big. I actually have a one to one, but my friends borrowed. Wow. It. Um, and again, to your point of so much detail for something that yeah. isn't going to get made. It's, so so I mean, if you. Even the inside, like even the roof of his mouth, that looks... like they didn't really have to go to this. I don't wow. know if I can get it in there, but there's the ridges of the roof of his mouth, like all this detail that's in here, just needless because when it's shrunken down, a lot of the stuff's going to get lost. But that's, that's why true. it was done at two up, and that's why it was done. Uh, so strongly, this was done by a friend of mine named uh, Dave Billio, who uh, was also a sculptor for Hasbro. And um, so the idea behind War Dog, this is unassembled, is that you would pull his tail in and out, his mouth would open. Okay. His mandibles would go oh, he has mandibles too. <laughs> like this, and his tongue would come in and out at the same time. Wow. And then he was going to have these horns on top. I also have concept art, which I should have brought for him. Um, and then he was going to have a gun mounted on his back, a glow-in-the-dark gun <laughs> that was sort of like mounted on his back. Now, uh, the original model for this, which you can see on yojo.com, is uh, it's, it's Hot Wheels 
and Jurassic Park sort of it's a it's like a Jurassic Park I think Demetrodon mm-hmm. with Hot Wheels parts like for like his gear or whatever wow. is like the mock up for it. So again back to Hasbro taking just weird competitor stuff and saying, Hey, we want it to kinda of look like this. Man. Um and this is one of as much as that is my most significant piece, this is my favorite piece because he's just I love the weird stuff and That's... he's this absurd yeah I, just I, I if i saw that i definitely wouldn't think gi joe, GI joe exactly all. um oh. he was actually going to be someone's pet and we're not really sure who's i mean that's how standard issue for GI um, joe. yeah well this would have been 1995 and the thing is in 1995 you have so much canceled gi joe product that we still haven't seen at all mm. um there's a line called x soldiers which was um going to be hasbro's answer to x-men before they came up with oh, Extreme. Wow. so it's 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 you know a lot of things that kind of look like you know when image or uh, other lines would do their version of Captain America, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. just like that. Super. Patriot. It's just like that. Yeah, it's it's that that same idea um, <laughs> where the characters look. They're supposed to remind you of something that they're not. Okay. But these were going to be GI Joe and Cobra. Like there's this guy <laughs> named Egghead who's just this floating. He's very Modoki, you know. Oh, okay. But he's this giant egg floating in a chair with little arms, and he was going to be a GI Joe. Like you know what I mean? Like it's they 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 were they were competing with things like X Men, competing yes. with things like. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers. People complain about the direction that J.I. Joe was going, whether it's the weird stuff, the aliens, the eco-warriors. It's, it's, it's hard It's hard to, to but, imagine. But if that's your yeah. job and you have to feed your kids or you have to pay bills, you have to be the guy yeah. who finds an answer. Yeah. Even if the answer is sitting in front of you the whole time, like even if this is where J.I. Joe is supposed to be, like the non-crazy military one step in the future thing, fine. Um, a lot of people misunderstand J.I. Joe because even though the people who were behind J.I. Joe were... were a lot of them were military sculptors and artists and whatever. Mm-hmm. G.I. Joe was never supposed to be this military line. It was supposed to be more like Mission Impossible with military aesthetics, okay. but always one step in the future. Okay, I see. Um, yeah. And the, the thing is, is that because of the, the cost and because of um, you know things like Stalker, which are very strange. Stalker has always looked like this from his first appearance in Ron Rudette's pitch book. He was always pretty much just like this. Where someone like uh, like Grand Slam or you know, there's uh, in Ron Rudette's pitch book, um, th- they have these giant laser backpacks and laser helmets, and they look more futuristic than Star Wars. Hmm. So whenever GI Joe people were like, "Oh, I hated when GI Joe got crazy," I'm like, "No, no." In 1981, GI Joe was already crazy. It just also had this. Yeah. Um, originally, Snake Eyes was a character named Mr. Bombs, and he was this guy with a <laughs> dude like a like a, a half mask type thing, okay. kind of like um, Iron Fist. Okay. And like a big like porn mustache. Wow. And just bombs all over him, and his name was Mr. Bombs. Wow. But then he got fused with a character that Larry Hama had created called Spook. And they put the two together, and then you have Snake Eyes. But then Snake Eyes, who was the very first G.I. Joe that they kind of ran off on the line, mm-hmm. who was all black, originally he was going to look more like this. He was going to have, like, we, we think he was going to have, like, more, like, camo pants with, like, a, a greenish-blackish top closer to this. Okay. Um, you know, and he was just going to be this masked thing that was going to look more like the first 13 figures did. But for cost, they just said, you know what? He looks nice in black. I mean, he's... He's the first example of Hasbro cheaping out. Okay. And he's the most iconic GI Joe. He is. He's, he's embraced. Yeah. So 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 everything that people hate that Hasbro does, like you know, cheaping out on paint apps, whatever. He's basically a walking test shot. Yeah. And he's got over how many versions of Snake Eyes are there, Andrew? Forty three, fifty three. He's 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 this he's this thirty year celebration of cost cutting. <laughs> but he's the most iconic. I, he's he arguably he I mean, he's he's he, one of the most iconic ninjas in pop yeah. culture. Oh man! So I mean, that's you know, that's the and that that that's kind of like what I said earlier about the information. Like I love okay that I absorb. But why GI Joe of all things? You could it could be anything. I okay, mean, when I was little, I loved He Man, Thundercats. Me you too. Know. Oh yeah. The difference was is that when I got a Thundercat figure, I couldn't play with it like a Thundercat. When I got a He Man figure, I could almost play with it like a He Man figure. When I got a GI Joe figure, not only could I play with it. And it's, I mean, the, the articulation and the detail was there. Um, but the G.I. Joe cartoons, yeah. uh, they dictated playability to me. Where I didn't get that from other cartoons. Other cartoons, I mean, some of them. Some of, like, Thundercats kind of told you how to play with your Thundercats. But yeah. G.I. Joe, for some reason, just translated that so much better to me as a kid. And I remember thinking that to myself. Because I remember I'd sit there looking at my G.I. Joe's and go, you know, I'd rather play with these. Yeah. Like, I would just rather... It was the articulation, the scale, everything was just what I wanted mm-hmm. out of a toy. Thundercats were big and stupid. They were really I, big. I loved them. Yeah. You know? Uh, like, I loved Mask. I loved Mask. Mask, But yeah. you know what? In order to play with Mask, 
after a while, cars turning into vehicles, same with Transformers, robots turning into car, there's a limitation there because they own their you can't take them out of their element. You can't take masks out of their element and have that much fun with them because they're just then they're just little GI Joes that aren't articulated. Mm -hmm. Then you're so it always came back to just how much I could do. And uh, so as a kid, I mean, GI Joe was always my favorite. And uh, I told myself I'd always go back and collect GI Joe one day. And um, one day I was walking through Target about five years ago, and I saw the uh, GI Joe Matt Tracker 25th figure. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's mask and it's GI Joe. And I was so focused on it, I didn't realize that I was looking at something which I hadn't seen before, which was the 25th anniversary modern line. So then all of a sudden I zoomed back and I'm like, whoa, this is G.I. Joe, and the packaging looks familiar, and the characters look just like they did when I was little. There's different, you know, they've advanced. And I was like, where did this come from? I had no idea. I had no idea like that G.I. there was a 25th anniversary G.I. Joe anything. And so huh. I bought the Matt Tracker and a couple more. Um, and so that's how I came back to G.I. Joe. But as a kid, it was always just the most ideal... Something about it was just the most, the most fun. From when I got my, I think I got my first one like '83. It wasn't because it was military. It wasn't because um, they were colorful. I mean, that was all part of it to an extent. But honestly, it was just they were the most fun, and they still are to me. I mean, I still think that I still think like these figures are more fun than any other figure that's ever existed. I don't care how much playbill. I don't even care if it's sculpted better or you can pose them better. I just something about these are just so much fun that I can't, like, I can't ignore that. Yeah, you know, so. How would you define nostalgia in the prototype and G.I. Joe stuff? Okay, so G.I. Joe is a little different um, because there's people who are recently people who have come out of the Guardians of the Galaxy movie who didn't grow up with Star Wars and they're to them this is their Star Wars for yeah. better for worse. They're I've heard that. Yes, and it's and it's it's got me. I, I've been thinking about it a lot actually. G.I. Joe didn't have that. G.I. Joe had a cartoon and a comic book. I never grew up reading the comic books because for me, what I wanted out of comics was as much fantasy as possible. Yeah. I was an X-Men reader. For me, it was always mutants because it was an internal thing that, that, that went outward. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't mm -hmm. like the sun makes Superman stronger, you know, that kind of thing. Batman has to work out. Otherwise, he's just crazy as right. much as I love Batman. <laughs> but, but, you and my brother both. Trust but <laughs> X-Men was more, X-Men was just, there was something about it, about, you know, it couldn't be helped. It wasn't an accident. And... Uh, you know, it started internal and, and pushed out. That's what I wanted out of comic books. So I never yeah. read the J.J. Joe comics. Um, but there's people who, who have, and the, mm -hmm. they're, they're, those are completely di The people who, rely, who, who grew up on the comics are very different than the people who grew up on the cartoons. And the people who grew up on both are very different than the people who didn't. And the people who uh, just grew up with the toys, mostly, they're very... Like, J.J. Joe's sort of... Uh, there's different facets. Mm -hmm. Um... And that, that kind of changes, that's why our, the landscape of our hobby is so weird. But to answer your question, um, so for J. Joe, the nostalgia is a little different. For some people, it's the military aspect. It's, it's, you know, either their parents were military, and so for them, there's something vicarious that they can kind of live through. Um, some people just were enamored with, uh, not war, but like the military aesthetics. Right, I mean, right, there's, yeah. you know, just people that collect everything. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that nostalgia that, that they sort of grip onto. Um, you know, for other people, it was the personality that either Larry Hama or, you know, Buzz Dix, anyone that from the comics to the, to the, the cartoons, uh, the personalities, um, are what tug on them for nostalgia. Mm. Um, but for me, it's not so much that I need to be reminded of my childhood. It's not that, um, that I'm like, that I can't let it go or that I, um, uh, it's not like a familiar smell where you're like, oh, I smell barbecue and I remember that time at camp. Like for me, it's not that... <laughs> For me, it's not taking my childhood for granted. Like these toys, um, which is one of the altruistic aspects of action figures, which there's been a lot of tests of um, and a lot of marketing for, is that, that I, I acted out uh, sort of my emotions, my creativity, my frustration, everything through these toys. So for me, the nostalgia is just not taking my childhood for granted. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it does. Totally makes it's, sense. It's, it's, it's respecting my origins. Okay. So even the things in my life that, you know, that I just wish hadn't happened, I don't take them for granted. And so for me, the nostalgia is, I, I, I don't know, I think it's different for everyone. I think there's similarities. Um, you know, there's things where I walk around Todd's store and I'm like, oh my God, I, I need to buy that because I love, <laughs> like that's what, that to me, that's the, the plain nostalgia. I'm like, oh my gosh, that reminds me of a childhood, I should own that. I do that every you know time I, mean? I yes. come into Todd's store. Yeah. So. <laughs> for, me, for me though, as far as uh, how I sort of deal with, or how it, nostalgia sort of interacts with me otherwise is that, um, 
It's where I came from. Because what else did you do as a kid? You played basketball. Well, you can still play basketball today. Yeah. But you can't play with toys the way you did as a kid. You no. can't. It could be argued you can't draw. And it, I think it's the same for kids. Like, I drew a lot of comic book characters growing up, even though I'm a terrible artist. <laughs> but I was more, for me, it was more about the story than the art, so I didn't care. Right. But it's the same thing with comics. You would ask me why I'm nostalgic about comics. It's not the characters. I mean, there, there's parts of that. But for me, it's, it's, it's that's how I, that's how I got here. Mm. Um, as a person, and if I re if you really enjoy yourself, like you, I'm I'm guessing you've gone back and tried to figure out why. And I don't mean that in an right. egotistical way. I mean no. like if you're happy, to an extent, you go back and you try to figure out how you got there, and you yeah. you don't take it for granted. So, okay, um, it's a little different, but okay. So how do you use the prototyping industry as a social piece? Well, yeah. Well, so basically, um, one day I saw this. Uh, at the time, the Rise of Cobra movie was about to come out, and no one really knew much about it, and there were these prototypes on eBay and these these leaked figures from China and no one really knew what some of them were and people were guessing like what is this what is this like you know what is this going to be what is that snake eyes you know the movie wasn't out and the toys weren't out so everyone was just kind of like there were these rumors and these press releases and everyone's trying to make sense of it so I came in and uh, for me it was twofold uh, for me the unpainted prototypes and even some of the painted ones they looked like accidental art to me I mean there's parts of them that are art like the sculpting or whatever but Usually they just use with plastics lying around when they do like unpainted test shots, which which Todd has a few in his case, which is real funky. They're in pink and green, and they just look like like someone threw up Voltron, but really <laughs> neatly. And um, so for that, there was this, this 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 sort of accidental art to it, which I really appreciate. I was like, oh, that's really funky. Like I really I like that for what it is. But at the same time, I was looking around at all these people and all the confusion. I was like, you know, I'm gonna buy a couple of these so people can get an idea of what they're. Because no one else, I mean, some people were, were bidding on them, some people were hesitant, some people didn't really, like, there was a whole sort of, um, there was a, a history of, of prototypes from China from the earlier eras of G.I. Joe uh, in the 90s and 2000s that had caused a lot of confusion and chaos and anger and actually had split the hobby. Wow. Um, Hasbro would say, so for example, in the without getting too much off topic, in the right. 2000 era and like the, the, the late 90s stuff, um, ha things would come out of China and Hasbro would say, no, that's not ours, someone's making those. And terms like um, Midnight Chinese, and uh, I'm being told there were 67 Snake Eyes, by the way. So Snake Eyes, is, Snake Eyes Snake Eyes is 67 celebrations of costume. Now, some Snake Eyes have paint on them. That's not fair. Right. But there's a lot. Anyways, so um, uh, like in the, we'll just roughly call it like the 2000 era, these things would end up out of China and whatever. And um, uh, Hasbro would take no claim. They would say, oh, no, those somewhat... They started being called midnight Chinese or lunchtime specials. Someone in China is just making those on their lunch break. We mm. don't we don't endorse those, whatever. And so half the half the hobby would go. I don't think that's right. And the other half would go. See, it's not real. And it caused this this chaos where net forums would post these things for news, right. and Hasbro would send them cease and desist or say you can't post this anymore. So at the time, Hasbro was a lot closer to the hobby in that regard. They were having okay. more conversations with us. Okay, I wasn't around. Um, and so that kind of starts there, where there's this like uncertainty when it comes to reproduction. So I was like, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna buy some of these things and maybe people can make more educated guesses. You know, so I bought like these test shots from China or these unreleased figures that well so far unreleased. And I'd post pictures of them. Now most people would take a take an action figure that they got, like a, a rare thing, and take a picture of it and go, look what I got. Wow. Well I would get them from China and I would I would play with them and take pictures. So I would take really crazy pictures of them with like ketchup splattered behind them, like. And even though they're these like prototypes, like, because because there was nothing else. If nothing else, uh, there were no painted samples for some of them. Some of them were just these unpainted, uh, you know, figures, whatever. Um, but I was having fun with them because I I, I was telling them I was like, you know, this is what your toys are going to look like in a year, and this is going to look like when you play with them. Mm. You know, whether you pose them, whatever. I I took it to a different extent. So people, I I just kept doing this. I kept getting everything first. And I mean, there were people who were like, "Oh, he just wants to be the first one to have everything." And honestly, that's part of it. Part of it, it's not like an, an egotistical thing. But if you're, I mean, you're doing a documentary. Right. If you if you have a blog or you're a journalist, uh, and that is what you do, you have to be the one to get them first. That's what promotional things are. Now, these weren't officially promotional. It's not like Hasbro was is sending things out to people. Right. But the idea of it, you know, it, some people get you know comics from IDW or whatever first or Marvel, so they can mm -hmm. review it. For me, I kind of. We, didn't, we don't really have that. We don't have Hasbro sending out toys to people to review, so That's we true. have to make do. And so for me, from a journalistic thing, it was to be responsible. I just, 
wanted to be the first person to get everything because I had already started doing that. It was a consistency thing. I, it was uh, not like I felt a responsibility, like it wasn't that serious, but it was, uh, you know, I'm already doing this. People are appreciating it. I'm just going to keep doing it. Hmm. So despite the detractors who were like, oh, he's just looking for attention. I was like, no, but the attention helps because then everyone gets to see it. They get to make a more informed, you know, decision right. about toys that are coming out. And honestly, there's things that I've posted um, that were long canceled that because I they got so much attention, they went through and made them anyways. Hmm. So I've actually been able to affect the brand in that regard. No bragging rights attached. It's right. just been, you know, um, like this art, for example. I found this art when I first met Bill Merkline before my, G. my first G.I. Joe convention. No one had ever seen Blowtorch in green before. Hmm. So I brought this back from Bill's house after Joe Con, put a picture of it online. It got so much attention that Hasbro went and did a repaint of this of Blowtorch in the Pursuit of Cobra Line. It never got released. You know, mm -hmm. but they this the past was able to affect the future. That's cool. I can't take that for granted. Right. I can't take credit for it. It's not like I was like, hey, what if they made <laughs> this? But I'm connected to it, yeah. and I care about that. Like yeah. I'm, I'm happy. So, anyways, That's awesome. um, anyways, long story short, um, which actually goes back to that first JoeCon. Um, I had met uh, uh, Sam Damon and Jason Wells, and Sam Damon is the founder and owner of Joe Declassified. And Sam is sort of the uh, second in command, if you will, although it's pretty equal because, I mean, we don't really have, like, a structure in that regard. Right. Um, but if you had to, that, you know, they'd hate me for saying this, but if you had to, that's like... Anyways, um, Jody Classified is this not-for-profit not organization um, that um, that wants to put some transparency on the history of G.I. Joe, on the hobby of G.I. Joe, whether it's rare stuff, international stuff, paperwork, folders, books... Um, stories about the hobby, uh, prototypes, um, you know, you name it, it's something that Jody Classified tries to embrace, you okay. know, without bias. Um, so even if there's a prototype of something that no one likes, you know, we, we try to be responsible about it and present it because someone might. So Jody Classified, uh, you know, uh, at the time they were setting up this booth at G.I. Joe, Con at Joe Con, um, like the main G.I. Joe convention. And uh, they'd done it a couple years, and then they would put out a magazine about, you know, a certain aspect of Jejo's history or about um, foreign releases, rare items, stuff like that. And um, the idea was to sort of give the hobby back to collectors uh, because there was just so much, there was just a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. And so Jody Classified was like, well, this is something that, that they could do to, to give back to the hobby um, because of how unique the things that they deal with are, you know, are sort of... Everything that's contained within it is so unique that it it can tell a story, it can tell the story, it can make you appreciate somewhere, it can elevate the conversation um, that 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 that's in the hobby. And I got introduced to these guys, and a year later, before the next show con, I got called and said, "Hey, do you want to help run the Jody Classified booth?" And I was like, "Oh my gosh, yes! Like, I would love that." Wow. Um, and so I decided to, uh, you know, I I had the ability. Um, and was the most willing, I guess, to, to take it a little further. So I started um, taking the Joe Declassified booth to other conventions, not just Joe Con. So I went to Canada Con, Coil Con, which we talked about earlier, um, mm -hmm. the third year of Coil Con. Well, the second year I set up sort of as myself in the in sort of the, the same way that Joe Declassified did, but I wasn't affiliated with them at the time. Um, and same with the first assembly required in Iowa, which is a another great J.I. Joe show. I kind of just set my stuff up so people could see it, but I wasn't affiliated with Jody Classified. But this is why they kind of reached out to me. It was like, okay, obviously you're, we're on the same page and we like to, to do the same stuff for people. Um, so I, you know, I've toured the Jody Classified uh, booth, um, St. Louis, Canada, Kane County in Chicago. Um, so to answer your question, you know, Jody Classified, I've sort of surrendered myself to it. It's not about me. Um, despite how much infamy or micro fame I get from, because I'm the most public, mm -hmm. and the goggles help because everyone's like, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> it's the guy with the goggles. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, just because of how many people know me, it seems like it's sort of like a my thing, but it's not. Like I've surrendered myself completely. Everything I do, I do for Jody Classified. You know, um, if Sam says jump, boy, do I jump. Like you know, I, I believe in what they do. Um, I should say I believe in what we do. Yeah. Um, and so for us, it's it's you go to a convention. And you're there to, you know, to buy stuff or to get the exclusives or to hang out with your friends. We try to give people something else. So we set up this booth and everyone brings parts of their collection, whether it's prototypes or, you know, rare foreign stuff or molds or paperwork or just, you know, 
odd licensed item you don't get to see in person all the time, just so people can can sort of experience that. You know, uh, we don't allow photos or video because we want it to be exclusive to your experience. It's not like a. I mean, there are people that, that donate stuff to us that don't want photographs on the internet other stuff, but for the most part, it's just it's supposed to be for you. You came out to the convention, so a lot of people are like, "Well, that's not fair. I wasn't there." So I've tried to go to as many places as I can afford that will take me or you know a group of us and do this. I um, mean, people will actually send me pieces from their collection. I mean, they'll send me thirty thousand dollars worth of artwork to bring for a day, mm. and trust me with it because they know that I'm gonna you know take care of it, whatever. And then I got to go mail it back, but. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, uh, for me it's 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 to, like I said earlier, this kind of stuff can help elevate the conversation. You can make. I've seen people walk out of a Jody Classified booth, um, whether I'm there or someone else is there, and just be like, "Wow, okay, like I kind of I kind of care again." Like there's people who have have literally just been on the verge, they're just like, ah, "I'm done," and then they see something and it kind of brings them out of it, or like they see something that surprises them, or see something that makes them care about what they're doing more. I mean, I, there's. There's people that have just um, that have actually you know helped volunteer with Declassified because of Declassified. They've just been like, I want to be a part of this because this made me feel uh, better or different about my hobby and about toys, or whatever. Okay. Um, like, what's the passion like for the the people who who collect GI Joe and and or prototypes? Oh well, for GI Joe, it's like uh, man, uh, GI Joe is different because GI Joe was was a very cheap action figure, mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of you know, it was it was something that a lot of the sort of low-income kids, you know, the families bought, mm -hmm. and so there's people that wasn't why they bought it, but it was it was a great toy that was also and there's 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 definitely some of that that has you know this is what what I had as a kid, you know, um, you know, uh, and it, it means a lot to people um, who maybe couldn't afford a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, there's you know. Uh, you know, the, the passion comes from the fact that G.I. Joe, I mean, how many lines can you say have, I mean, G.I. Joe is 50 years now. How many toy lines can you say have 50 years under the belt? Transformers just hit 30. Wow, you true. know, Barbie's the only uh, sort of, and Barbie was never marketed really in the same way. Um, Barbie was probably role play before it was toy, which is kind of, I mean, it it, it kind of goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's so much in that 50 years that people, I mean, there's a split between 12 inch and you know three and three quarter inch collectors, but at its core, you know it's at the end of the day it's just GI Joe, oh. and like I think that the fact that it's one of the only toy lines that has 50 years under its belt and has been so influential, I mean I think that is a large part of the, the passion aspect of it. Like, how do you think that collecting prototypes can help preserve the history of these things? Prototypes can answer the questions that the toys cannot. Um, prototypes can tell the story that the toys cannot. And while they're just toys, mm -hmm. like, I mean, they're just toys. Like, let's just, let's be real clear. First of all, this shouldn't still exist. It should have been destroyed. That should have been destroyed. We shouldn't be sitting here talking about something that was, I mean, these, we were, these were not created for us to collect. When you see collect them all in the back of a 1980s package, mm -hmm. that is to get you as a child or your parent or parents to purchase them and make Hasbro a lot of money. Mm. But... You can't change the fact that people now collect these things, and now there are adult collectibles. Yeah. So collecting prototypes, they, they they give you the the who, what, where, why, and when that something exists. Now some people don't care. There's people who could care less. I have friends who who respect what I do, but they could care less about a prototype. They, to them, this is a Buck Rogers figure carved, you know, sculpted in clay and painted on. It's not the very first Jedro prototype, which mm -hmm. it technically is, but they don't care. Right. They don't care. They don't care that this is why they collect G.I. Joe. They could care less. And I love them dearly. It doesn't, to me, I, I don't, you know, it's, you collect the way you want to collect. Mm -hmm. um, but, but prototypes, they tell that story that looking at the toy, you know, you're like, oh, you know, wow, they even sculpted the wrinkles on his butt. And like, you know, <laughs> why, why doesn't this move? And why, I mean, it, you know, from articulation to aesthetics to character creation, I mean, it, it just, it, one prototype can tell you so much. Um, and uh, I think that if you introduce certain people to that aspect, um, they begin to understand more. I mean, you know, these things were, were created for like three reasons. One, so that you would spend money on them, or your parents would spend money on them. Um, two, so that you would buy more of them. Uh, and three, so you didn't choke on them. Yeah. And, you know, prototypes can answer all of that. Prototypes can answer, you know, 
most questions that you have about what you love mm -hmm. and maybe why you love them. Like a lot of it's marketing. A lot of the, the reasons they were done a certain way is so that you could not resist. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a psychology there. Um, I actually have uh, a 1987 Hasbro marketing research guide <laughs> where they sat a bunch of kids down and this book actually predicts the end of toy lines that showed up in like, you know, that died in like 1988, like Brave Star. And, uh, yeah. you know, Brave I mean, it, it really does. It really says like kids are like, well, I don't like that. And you'd think that a small group of people in like, you know, one or two little towns like, that are kids. I mean, kids don't really know what they want to an extent. Right. <laughs> but wow, like there's things in here that are just like, oh, you know. And so it's stuff like this that like, you know, it just it, it tells a story. And, you know, um Telling stories is kind of why you play with toys anyway. So this is like telling the adult story of that. Okay. Um, that there were these toys didn't make themselves. There were, you know, artists, designers who, who sat there and literally bled. Like Guy Cassidy talks about how, how much styrofoam he inhaled sculpting Serpentor's chariot. You know, like that's wow. that's poison. He poisoned himself so that you could play with a toy that you might not even remember now. Wow. Like so, you know, that's that's sort of the the story of prototypes. Is it interesting to some people? Like I said, other people could care less, and that's fine. But that's, Everyone that's like that in any in anything. In anything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so how many prototypes do you have? <laughs> um, not a lot. I'm really picky. Really. I used to have like like I used to have more. Like people always assume I have this massive collection because the thing is, I've spent the last five years sharing so much stuff that some of it I did own, but then I just let it go to someone who wants it more. Because I mean, that's that's sort of. Prototype collectors they're, are kind of split up into the groups. There's the real private collectors who don't want anyone to see their stuff. And they're, it's really hard to get to convince them, like, hey, people are going to really... No, because there was a time, which I kind of touched on earlier, there was a time where if you posted this kind of stuff, you were an elitist, you were a total asshole, sorry, you were a total jerk, um, you know, you were bragging, uh, or someone would say, well, why can't I have one of those? Or there was like this entitlement thing where they would mm. say, I deserve to see this. And people oh, were just wow. like, whoa, hang on. I paid whatever for it. You don't deserve. And there, there's always an entitlement attitude to everything. Huh. Um, it's in the music scenes. It's in the, you know, I should have this. I should have it for free. I should have it. I should be able to see it. It scared a lot of people away. So those are the private collectors. Then there's the people who are willing to share and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but but honestly, the secret to, to kind of networking in the in the in this in this hobby is saying you know what gary has all this stuff for uh there you go okay. well, there's two down three you know gary has all this stuff for desert scorpion so when i find something for desert scorpion it'll go to gary gary has you know i have like a bunch of stuff for the night landing so when gary has uh you know gary has the night landing prototype so when i find night landing, so it goes to gary and so mm -hmm. when i find stuff i'll be like wow that's really cool but my friend has this. That's really cool, but you know what? I know someone who has like a, we call this a run. So when you have multiple pre-production items that tell the story of how one character got created, we call that a run. Mm -hmm. So, oh, my friend has a Snake Eyes run or my friend has a Road Pig run. You kind of want it to go to them because in return, they're gonna look out for you. So I don't have a lot because for me, as long as I, I, I I'm, first of all, I'm really picky. It has to be something that I'm attached to. Like, you know, if I had never met Bill Merkline, this would be a really cool tulip to have, but because Bill's a friend and like family to me, right. I love that I have one of his original sculptures. You know, um, uh, you know this obviously, you know, I love having that and I never get rid of it. But right. I don't need to have. Um, I personally don't need to have. You know, every prototype I come across. Otherwise, this table would be full of just <laughs> stuff that it's great, it's fantastic, and I appreciate it for what it is. But I wouldn't have an attachment to it. Right. Um, but people always assume I have like all these prototypes, and then I have like this crazy collection. I'm like, no, I'm so I'm just a picky individual. Like I don't, you know, I don't buy every DVD for every movie I like. I don't buy every CD for every song I like. Right. Like I'm just very like I'm just picky in general. So I I I. Every year I shrink it down more and more until I'm happy with what I have, mm -hmm. until I find something I need to have. So no, I don't, I don't have a lot. I mean, this isn't everything, but um, this is all the not big stuff, and I didn't bring any modern stuff because I don't think that, I don't think it's important, but I don't think it's as interesting as the vintage stuff. Yeah. I, um, it's interesting on its own level. Right. So. How would you say perceived value plays a role in prototypes in G.I. Joe? Um, the, the the cliche of it, but it's all it's not even really cliche. It's just the, the basic of it is that things are only worth what you're what someone's willing to pay. And obviously eBay's changed that. Um, I used to collect vintage Star Wars, like really rare vintage Star Wars stuff when I was in high school, and then my whole collection was stolen. That's a whole other documentary. Um, but 
you know, um, there were, I would find stuff that was like, you know, I'd find like a, an Uze, you know, Star Wars bootleg figure for like 200 bucks. Now they go for like 600, I don't even pay attention. Um, like I had two unpunched, uh, just mint Power of the Force Yak faces. Um, I got them for like $300 each back then. Wow. And now they're just thousands of, you know, I had two Power of the Force Nictos and um, even the roughed up ones go for like seven grand now. All gone, stolen, again, another documentary. Oh, don't have fun. those anymore. Fun. Um, perceived value is a much different uh, animal. It's like, um, uh, you know, you go to eBay completed prices and you see, oh, this went for a thousand three times and then once it went for 500 and then another time it went for three. Like it's, it can be so volatile, it can be so chaotic that pinning that down is almost ridiculous and yet people still try to do it. Um, you know, perceived value with prototypes, like we kind of talked about earlier. Like, uh, you know, there's people who think this is kind of worthless because it's not a G.I. Joe. But there's other people who think it's invaluable because it is. Right. The G it's the first real American hero. Yeah. It's um, Another example is uh, packaging artwork. So the big paintings that they would do, um, and then they would, you know, make transparencies of them like, like this. Like someone would do the painting of the locust. And then it would end up on a transparency. And this you could put on any packaging, any catalog, any t-shirt. You could do whatever you want with this. You could okay. still do it today. Okay. You could recreate the packaging art other than the background, obviously, for That's the really, locust using this. That's really cool. I've never um, seen one of those before. Oh, yeah. I've got, I got one for Ice Cream Soldier. And then I have huh. one in here for uh, Toxo Zombie. And then what they would do is when they had the art down, they would always make sure that they had extra copies to as like reference for other people. So that, you know. Okay, they, okay. Yeah. Um, or they could reuse it for other markets. Yeah. Anyways, so um, packaging art, you know, there's people that believe that the packaging art, because it is what is on the box, is more valuable because it's packaging art. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's why you bought this or that, because of that packaging art. So that's super valuable. And there's other people like, no, the concept art, which is probably usually different, has different details, different characters. Uh, they have a different head or different color. Mm -hmm. That's more valuable because it's unproduced and it's like it's split. So perceived value in prototypes is crazy. Okay. Um, when it comes to vintage and modern prototypes, I look at it this way: vintage prototypes have a value, modern prototypes have a price, because it's not. There's so there's even less people collecting modern GI Joe prototypes mm -hmm. than there are vintage, and it's a such a small circle of people that if no one wants something, that thing has no value. Okay. I mean, there's there's extremely rare modern prototypes sitting on eBay right now. Nobody's buying them. Not even the people who have the money to do it. Wow. Not even the people that would buy it just because. Hmm. So it's, it's, perceived value is like this. I mean, it's, I think you can pin down certain things. Like, you should never pay this much for that. But at the same time, there's things that I've overpaid for because of who had it. I'm one of those people that thinks that uh, certain collectors have sort of reached this level that if you get something from their collection, it kind of means more because they've preserved it. They did the footwork, um, even if it's not a prototype. You know, it's just um, they like, uh, for example, this this woman, Air Devon, um, who's widely considered one of the most, if not the most famous G.I. Joe collector who just recently sold her entire collection. Um, if something comes out of Air Devon's collection, that means it was preserved. It wasn't collected. Mm -hmm. uh, it was archived. Um, uh, in some pre-production circles, there's people who think that if, if you don't see it, it's worth more. There's other people who think if it's public, it's worth more because everyone knows it exists. Then there's people who think that if it was published in a magazine, like uh, like uh, like any toy magazine, yeah. that it's worth more because it's been archived. And that's kind of where I come from when I say that, you know, if it came out of Air Devon's collection or if it came out of someone like uh, my friend Kevin Watts' collection, I do think it's worth a little more, even if it's not, because it's... To me, it's it was preserved. It wasn't collected. It wasn't. Uh, I see. I see what you're saying. It wasn't kept in a bin because it was in a bin. It was in a bin because, you know, Kevin Watts uh, is also a GI Joe historian. Air Devon's also a GI Joe historian. So I mean, perceived value just it's all over the place. Does your collection define you? No. 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 I could walk away. F I could if 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 someone came in here right now and said, you know, uh, I'll give you whatever for all this. Um, the only thing that would stop me was offering it to my friends first. Hmm. Um, you know, I'd be like, well, hang on, because I, I'd feel a responsibility to, for people that care about it. Right. But honestly, I don't, it doesn't define me at all. Like I said earlier, it, it, it reminds me um, how I grew up, um, and especially the prototypes remind me that there was someone behind, that there was always an adult making my toys, which you obviously don't think about, and right. you, most people would take for granted. That's but true. There's, there's these professional artists that, you know, that, that, that did this. Um, 
and uh, I don't think it defines me at all. In fact, I would argue that I define my collection. That that you know because you collect it, it doesn't define you. You define it. Now, obviously, there's examples of people who can't resist, whether it's like a hoarder right. mentality or the, like an impulse thing. Then I think your collection starts not defining you, but sort of mirroring you. Mm. But I would I would argue that I define my collection because of how picky I am. It might be different for someone else. Um, a friend of mine, Chris Murray, he um, he likes to have one of every step in the pre-production process. Like so, like he has like a napkin sketch, and then he has you know uh, you know um, I helped him get some unused Hasbro wax, like bricks of wax. You know, like uh, he wants to have one of every step in the process. But that's it. If he doesn't really. At the end of the day, I think he'd be fine if he got rid of anything. If he had, like, he has, he has more than one two up, um, but he doesn't feel like he needs that more than one. So, in that respect, you know, I think he defines his collection um, because he has a focus. Okay. Um, but I do. Uh, there's probably people out there whose collection defines them, and that's because that's their um, that's that's their end of the eccentric spectrum, or that's their end of existence I, I that's fine that. i don't think there's anything wrong with it i could see just that. for me personally i think it's i think it goes the other direction okay um so what will happen to like what will happen to your stuff i mean are do you plan on like leaving it to your children like do you if if i had oh, i'm sorry go ahead I didn't mean no, to cut no, all right um uh kind of I've, I've touched on it a couple times like you know i would want this stuff to go to the right people there's certain stuff like this you know, I know my one of my friends just has a ton of two ups, and he would of course want any two up. But at the end of the day, if he was like, oh, I don't really want to pay for it, or I can't afford it, I just throw it on eBay. It doesn't matter. Something like this, I would want to go um, to someone that I know would uh, would bring it places and let people see it. Okay. Um, would not let it get forgotten. Um, it would be like the last thing they would sell. Mm -hmm. Something like this, um, I'd like to go to someone that had a Star Brigade focus. You know, it's it's one of those things where I like what I've kind of been repeating is that I, I feel responsible for this stuff, so mm -hmm. I would want to be responsible with it. Makes sense. So, you know, if I got cancer tomorrow, I'd be like, oh, well, I'm going to die, so, um, you know, burn it with me or something. No, I just, um, I'd want it to go to the right people. Um, and if I couldn't, I honestly, again, it, I could just walk away from it and just be like, oh, you can have this. <laughs> so okay. Now, I'm not going to lie, there's probably part of me that just for like a social experiment, might want to like destroy one on camera uh -huh. or paint it silly, but chances are I wouldn't do that. Uh, I guess so it depends how far along the cancer I, was. I, I guess so. Will you ever stop collecting prototypes? Stop collecting in general or stop collecting prototypes? Yeah, I mean, I the reason I stopped collecting Star Wars is because all my Star Wars got stolen and I told myself I'd never collect anything ever again. Um, even though I'd promised myself I'd always go back to G.I. Joe. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, would I ever stop collecting prototypes and collect other stuff? Probably not, because once you've gone like this deep, it's hard to go back to the normal stuff. Like it's hard to, it's really hard. I, can I mean, there's it. there's times where I'm just like, you know, like oh, if I got rid of this, what would I would I still collect GI Joe? Like, because once you get to this end, you're just kind of like, I mean, I love GI Joe no matter what, mm. but I also love not GI Joe. Right. It's but uh, as far as prototypes go, I. I, I I would never look at my collection the same way. Now, if I quit collecting, I would still go to JoeCon because I'd still come to Kokomo whenever I could because, I mean, the friendship's more important than anything. Right. I might still look for G.I. Joe information. Like, I might still help people dig stuff up because I'm really good at that. But, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I could just, you know, I don't, if I stop, though, I don't think I'd ever pick it back up. I mean, if I got rid of this, would I ever be like, I'm going to be a prototype collector again? It'd be really tough. I'm kind of the same way. I, I mean, if someone were to come in and steal or my house burned down, like lost everything, I don't think I would collect, start collecting the same stuff again. I, I Just to say I did it once was enough, um, especially with my, I have a huge Nintendo collection. Um, I'd, I'd probably just put it off as, that's. I did it once, it was fun. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's... I'd either do something else or whatever. Yeah, it's tough because I've spent... I've spent so much time bringing my stuff everywhere mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't even get a chance to display it anymore. Like, after this, uh, next weekend I've got to go um, to a local show in Chicago. And after that is CoilCon um, in Indianapolis. After that is uh, is um, Iowa... Assemb no, no, after that is Rollout Roll Call in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, after that is Iowa Assembly Required in Iowa. Um, and then it just starts again. You know, mm -hmm. then JoeCon comes. So, like... For me, I'm just like, I've spent so much time and spent so much money traveling and like 
touring my stuff or having my friends send me stuff to tour their stuff too and like or just everyone coming together that like I don't even you know whether it's getting information to write articles for the declassified magazine or I I have um I started the Joe Declassified podcast mm -hmm. um I don't know what I would do I mean we we don't have a lot of episodes because our 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 content is so different than other podcasts because we only stick to like rare stuff in pre-production and talking to former Hasbro people that it's we don't put one out every week because everyone's doing that which is their thing that's fine that's great but there's no reason for someone else to do it um but I don't know what I would, I'd be like oh my gosh I have all this information what what do I do with this information or um if I accidentally stumbled upon something I'd be like oh no like what do I do I already got rid of everything so but no I don't I, I think it'd be easy for me to just be like eh it's just stuff it's just toys okay my my last question is got to be what is with the custom Gary goggles so <laughs> figure so Todd who owns this store yeah. um, said I need a picture of you from head to toe and I need a bio I need a bio and I thought it was for the CoilCon website because I was a guest that year and um, I was like oh okay fine so I took a picture of myself head to toe and I wrote a file card but what I did was I did it I took all the mean things that people say about me okay and then I took what the way that uh, without the the finesse of Larry Hama, what it is took the way that the the Viper cards are written, mm -hmm. um, and I put the two together. So instead of having all my Viper qualities be like why I was a good Viper, um, I took all the things that people call me like smug, elitist, arrogant, um, and all that, and I put it into there to sort of own up to it because that's what else are you going to do with it? I right. mean, you just got to laugh it off. Um, so I give him this information, thinking full well it's for promoting CoilCon. <laughs> um, and uh, next thing I know, there's an action figure of me with a file card and my photo, and it's being raffled off to pay for the porta potty at CoilCon. Was it three? CoilCon three. Um, so it went for like what, like three hundred dollars on eBay. Um, and he made how many did you make? Seven, ten, five, twelve. And so then they raffled the rest off at at CoilCon. That's awesome. Um, and uh, how, how do you get one made of yourself? What I don't know. He, he, I mean, we, 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 all, we know a lot. We, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of customizers in our hobby who do right. this kind of stuff. And on a, on, this isn't the first one. This is the first one that one of my friends did without telling me. Um, other people have. I've got. I once got a package in the mail unmarked, just addressed to me. It was a custom someone did of me. Wow. Um, uh, someone's done a cast of my head to sell to people. Like that's sort of the, the sort of the micro fame that comes with with doing this. Like, how many followers do you have? Well, I've, there's a reason that people hate me because they just think the worst of me when, they, when my friends do things like this. So it's funny because when when people first saw it, like, oh, why does he get an action figure made of him? Like, I didn't do it. And then he's got a cardboard cutout of me in this outfit that he did life size. Okay. And of our friend Gary Godso, who's another uh, uh, very popular GI Joe collector. And um, I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for other people. Like, I have, like, three or four customs people have made of me. That's awesome. Um, people have made... One guy made a custom of me, and uh, and he he made sure to message me and say, I made this of you, but I'm keeping it for my collection. I was like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Whatever. That's fine. Whatever. It's a voodoo doll. I don't care. <laughs> um, you know, now Todd wants to raffle off that cardboard cutout, <laughs> I assume, so that my, my real fans can throw darts at it or burn it. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm sure it'll be floating through a bonfire at some point. But, yeah, so this was Todd's, I guess... Uh, uh, trolling love letter to me, um, and uh, I love it. I appreciate it for what it is, yeah. but it did make things more difficult um, because when you're as public as I am, people there a lot of people are going to assume the worst, or they're going to misunderstand. The internet is full of people misunderstanding other people, um, and even some of my best friends now they used to hate me because they didn't understand. Not hate me, but they didn't like me. Um, they didn't understand where I was coming from. They didn't understand why I was doing this so quickly when like. A lot of them had just, you know, take them a long time. I was like, I don't know. I'm just good at finding the stuff. That's just what I do. Right. Um, and now they all trust me to do it. Now they're all like, no, no, you do it. Like, you, you go ahead and find it and just... Because they know I'm then going to let them have it. And I'm not going to... Like you asked, like, how many do you have? Well, no, I'm just going to let them right. take it. So, yeah, that's how that's how that came about. Um, but it's not the first. It's just the first carded one. Hmm. I see. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a few of the others that people have made for me or they've made that are supposed to be... Uh, like an essence of me. They're not, some of them aren't supposed to be me. They're just supposed to be, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Yeah. Like some of them are like troop builders, but I, got you. I don't know. So that's where that came from. And that's, that's what happens when you, uh, when you put yourself out there. I see. Um, it well, can go cool. both ways. It's cool. So, um, how much have you ever seen a prototype go for? Um, 
there was a piece of packaging art for the Wolverine on eBay that was at like 22 grand, and I think it sold for 18. That's pretty high. Wow. Um, pa like, packaging art's different though because it's so so rare because uh, Hasbro still has a lot of it. Um, uh, my very first Joe Con uh, when I first met Bill Merkline and you know first met the guys from Declassified and um, a lot of other people that I, are now my best friends. Um, Hasbro let everyone come out on like let the let everyone into Hasbro for a tour. Let all this packaging art out um, from their vaults and uh, that stuff's extremely rare. And so the packaging art for, went for like. I think I think the final price like eighteen grand, from what I understand. It didn't go for the full twenty two, and that's pretty high. Um, there's a couple two ups out there that have like twelve, thirteen, fourteen grand price tags on them. The problem with that though is we don't know if they're really for sale. We don't know if they really exist. It's right. there's people out there who will they'll find out I have this or something, and they'll go to you and be like, if you don't know I have this because it's in a private collection, they'll go like, hey, uh, I can get you this for you know whatever five dollars. And you're like, oh, okay, and you give them $5. And then they come to me and say, hey, I've got $3, and that's $2 more than it's worth. And you're like, yeah, without really, like, you just made 2 bucks on it, or I made 2 bucks on it. Right. And that happens a lot. So it's hard to pin down how much of that price on some of these things are actually someone inflating them to make a profit or so they can buy some stuff. So it, it gets tough the rarer or more iconic or older it gets. It's, it's tough to, to pin down. But as far as pa packaging art seems to be the... The, the high thing. Um, one of the things we recently found out um, that I, it was like three of us that sort of, in short, um, I had found two, I had found three two up heads, and um, one of them uh, dated the other three heads. So all three heads were from 1981, except one head we still haven't even though identified. It's an unknown G.I. Joe. Huh. And the other head was Thunder, who came out in 1984, except we could date all these heads at 1981. So it proved that Thunder was originally sculpted for the 1982 line. So uh, we did this panel at JoeCon last year, and doing prep for this panel, I was like, let's see if we can figure out what the, what's up with these heads being 1981, but obviously Thunder being released three years later and who this unknown head is. So we sent out some feelers to some sources who we normally wouldn't go to, and we got back images of Breaker and Zap uh, with completely different heads. And... Um, and we got permission to use those images at our panel. And we're like, whoa, why do these heads exist? Why are, why do we now have Thunder, this unknown head, a, a completely different breaker head and a completely different Zap head? Um, and the breaker and Zap heads look like they're card art. So Zap has a mustache and he's got like a, his hair's like this and breaker has no beard at all. Hmm. And it literally, it, I mean, I, I, I hate to use the word literally, um, but literally at the same time, a friend of mine and I were like, oh my gosh, that's it. In the beginning, I bet you all 13 figures had their own original heads. Because in the beginning, you know, Grand Slam reuses the same head as someone else. Breaker okay. and Rock and Roll, they, you know, they, they reused heads for, like, cost cutting and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and so we're like, oh, my gosh, but how do we prove this? So we reached out even further, and we were able to confirm from former Hasbro designers that, yeah, in the beginning, all 13 figures were supposed to have their own original heads. Oh, wow. And so that is what Thunder and that unknown head is, or original heads for. So we think that, like, Thunder is the original head for Clutch. Uh, obviously, the the breaker head is actually rock and roll who has the beard because we've seen the breaker head and the zap head. Okay. Um, we think that the unknown head might be General Hawk. Um, and what's interesting about that is the reason that those heads are um, are different because uh, Hasbro was was in a rush. They had like a day to get everything out to China, so they stayed up to like four in the morning finishing sculpting waist pieces and heads to send out that morning. And in that rush, uh, along with cost cutting. Uh, they just said we're just gonna we're not gonna use these other heads we've done we don't have time we're just gonna reuse heads which was brilliant as far as cost cutting the difference is, is that there's a good chance that had all those heads been original JJ would have been more expensive mm. they might not have appealed to kids in the same way um, like if Snake Eyes hadn't hadn't if they hadn't decided to just release him in all black as a test shot instead of like a first shot instead of painting him up like he was supposed to be he might not be as iconic wow. that kind of a change could have altered GI Joe. To almost maybe in an unsuccessful, maybe in a more successful territory, maybe Snake Eyes would have been universally, you know, absorbed. It could it could have gone either way. So if someone out there were to turn up um, something that, like you know, a, a, a GI Joe two up, let's say, uh, with a, one of those heads on there, I mean, I'm sure that would just there's no there's no other precedence for that. Like that would probably just you'd have to find some. I mean, 
unless unless whoever had it didn't know what they had, and you're like, oh, I'll give you ten bucks for it. It's not. No one cares about two ops. Right. Um, but I'm something like that would probably be the top. Okay. The top end. That's cool. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. But uh, yeah, Gary, it's been great talking yeah, to you. Thank you. And um, we'll we'll keep in touch. Yeah. If you have any more questions, you can ask Todd. We'll do. <laughs>